Well, hey, welcome to a new season of the Sermon Notes podcast. I am your host, Jay Strother. And in this week's episode, we're going to dive deep into Sunday's sermon uh, in the Disciples Multiplying Disciples series. Our goal is to dig deeper into Sunday's message and discuss what it means to really be a disciple of Jesus. So Brian Ball is joining me today, uh, and he brings a wealth of knowledge and insights to the table. A couple things about Brian that you should know. Uh, One is that he has served this church in a variety of capacities, life group leader. Uh, He has been a trustee uh, in the past, Uh, but uh, we've picked him to be with me today because for 10 years, uh, we've been teaching at the Station Hill campus together every Wednesday night. Uh, And so we thought he'd be a great guy uh, to kick off uh, this, uh, this season of the podcast. Uh, because he and I have a lot of rapport together, and we spend a lot of time talking about gospel and gospel-related issues. Uh, and so together, we're going to gain valuable perspectives and practical applications uh, for our own spiritual growth. So Brian, so glad you could be with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank thanks for me. carving out some time. Uh, so uh, Brian, yesterday we began this series just planting our flag uh, in the gospel first and always. Uh, and you and I have talked before, uh, why is that important in the church, that we, we don't get past that as a fundamental? Well, it, it's everything, right? It, it, it is literally everything because it's the basis. And I love what you said yesterday. We talked about we started the gospel and walk out to anything. And so that grace sets the tone for anything we do as Christians, right? That we are under grace, that we are God's grace away from any sin, right? And God's grace. And so the only difference between us and anybody else is literally God's grace. And that gospel sets that tone. Mm-hmm. And so once once we as a church, right? And, and the church is the people, by the way. The church is not the building, That's right? right? And so we are the church. Yep. And the church, so when you're out engaging the community, the church is engaging the community. Right. This is. I actually went to my first church because the sign read, "Ex Baptist Church meets here." Hmm. Right. Because this is the meeting house. Yeah. And it's a wonderful meeting house. But the church is always present in the community. Right. Wherever That's our members good. are, wherever we are. Yeah. Our language matters, doesn't it, it? It does. And so, when it comes to the gospel, we have to be very clear about what the gospel is and yep. what the gospel isn't. That's right. Because people will add things to the gospel, and there are also false gospels. Right, which is one of the reasons in our mission statement we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Paul says there are people that are going to come teach you other gospels. And so we have to identify ours. It's Jesus, right? Not Jesus and or Jesus or. It's Jesus alone, yeah. right? And one of the fun little stories when we were adopting that mission statement a few years ago, right? The team had come up with engaging the whole person with the whole gospel anywhere, anytime with anybody. And you and several others raised and well done. Thank you. Uh, so we need to be explicitly clear that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right. So let's talk about that for a minute. So there's some competing gospel messages that are out there. What, what are some of the things that we're, we're prone to? Because one of the things I said yesterday is we're, we're prone to wander away from the true gospel. Well, we're prone to conform ourselves to the law instead of to Christ, right? And that's certainly, I'm getting ready to teach Romans 7, so that's certainly you know, prevalent on my mind. Yeah. Uh, but we do, and, that, and that's whether saved or unsaved, right? Mm-hmm. Because that gives you this kind of moralistic framework and yeah. checklist, right, that you can do. And so especially within the church, right, we tend to drift toward moralism. Toward you, it's not necessarily following the spirit of Christ. What is my my is my heart set? Mm-hmm. But am I doing these things right? And so we conform to the law instead of conforming to Christ. Yeah, a gospel of works. That's exactly works right. Works based righteousness. Well, and even works based sanctification, mm-hmm. right? Because the law mm-hmm. is there to show us what sin is. Yeah. Good. But the effort of sanctification is to conform to Jesus, mm-hmm. and that's critically important in what we do. Right? Critically important in what we do. There's obviously the prosperity gospel. Right, that if you're that if you're following Jesus, it's all going to be good. Yeah. Right, and anybody that's followed Jesus for more than about ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? The New Testament has quite a bit to say about that. Right, so. that you will you will suffer when you suffer. When not you suffer. if. That's exactly right. And so we know this is going to be a, a path of suffering, just like it was a path of suffering for Jesus. But we're doing it for a purpose. Yeah. Right, for the glory of God. And that makes all the difference. Yeah, I read a helpful article uh, about a year ago that talked about kind of alliterated, so it's helpful uh, for this Baptist preacher to remember, right? The the prosperity gospel, uh, which you just mentioned, uh, the political gospel. Yeah. You know, the idea that very few people would say, oh, my candidate or my platform or whatever is going to save the world, yet we act as if that's our only hope. That's right. And certainly, we want to see, right, gospel influence in the realm of politics. And we, our call to that. Absolutely. But, but the idea that that alone is going to save us exactly. is a 
false gospel, and then what's called the personal gospel or the self-help gospel, which is another version of what you were mentioning, the the works-based righteousness kind of gospel that's out there. That's right, and that's why it's important, as you said, to preach the gospel to yourself every day. Yeah. Right. Remember where we start. And I love that before your feet hit the floor. Mm-hmm. Right. Set set that tone for yeah. the day. Well, I say it because I need it. Right? I, yeah. I need <laughs> it myself. Both, we, we both do. Um, right? You've got to live those things. And, and I want to go back to something that you mentioned a moment ago, because I think this is really important and helpful. And I've, I've really kind of learned this language from you is, you know, when it comes to all of these issues and there, there's lots of issues coming at us from lots of different direction. Uh, it's always tempting, right, to say, well, kind of here's what I think or here's my opinion about this current. But you said we start with the gospel. Yep. And then we we walk out to the issue itself. Right. right. So help unpack that. What what does that look like? What uh, give us a practical application? Of sure. That. Well, I take that out of Deuteronomy, right, where it says, "Make his commandments right, a frontlet to your eyes, and bind it to your hands." Mm, and so Deuteronomy everything six, we see, yeah. everything we touch, is in light of the gospel. Right? So everything we see and everything we do is in light of the gospel. And so when we see these issues, we start with Jesus loves this person. Right? And we love everybody, by the way. We, we love God. We love our neighbor. We love our enemy. Right? We love one another. Right? The whole world will know we, are, we are belong to Jesus yeah. by how we love Good. each other. Yeah, John 13. Yeah, you, you would think that'd be how we love the world, yeah. how we love them, yeah. but it's not. It's how no, we no, love Brian, other. they will know we love them by our help. Christian bumper stickers. Yeah, absolutely, and our fish. And our T-shirts. We're, we're big fish people. <laughs> our little we're, fish we're on the back of, of our fish. car. We are people so. of the fish. But anyway, but, right, but, but what that comes down to is then in light of, of, of the, you know, the grace is the only thing between me and them, yeah. right? That, that in that light, when you walk out to common, to issues, to, to sexuality, right? I am God's grace away from being transgender. Right? That's the only thing that separates me is God's grace. He has just been gracious to me. And so that gives you a different light when you're dealing with that issue. I'm God's grace away from being a Pharisee, right? And Pharisaical in my, and, 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 you know, and so we just, when you take that in light of God's grace, it makes us more compassionate. Mm. It makes us more grateful, mm. right? And as we deal with those issues, we deal with them in a loving way. Because, and we've talked about, right, when you engage, the, when you're engaged in an issue, the first thing you do is engage the person. Yeah. Right. And you make sure you love them because and if your heart is not set at loving them, you need to stop because Mm -hmm. that's between you and the Lord. Yeah. And you need to set your heart right. And then as you love them, then walk out to an idea. Right. Whatever that idea is. And we walk from the gospel to that idea. And so that gives us the ability to minister and in, in any situation to any idea. And it's fantastic because when you see it in light of the gospel, right, you realize that this is a broken person. And there's, I, I, I'm, I love apologetics, as you know, I got a background in mathematics, and so lo- I love apologetics. And, and and I was really good at, at doing little quips, right, and kind of the the, the confrontational things, yeah, knowing all the answers, right. And the problem was was nobody was coming to see Jesus. Hmm. Right. Well, I had some self-satisfaction in my intellectual prowess, mm. right? Which well, that was not the object of the of the of yeah. the game or the object of the interaction. So as as I as I figured that out, I used reason as a way to love somebody, hmm. right? Because as you answered those questions, you could find the brokenness, yeah. right? That's in all of us. And, and the reason all of us came to Christ yeah. was once we found our brokenness, right? And then they are loved into the kingdom, That's right? Good. Coming into the kingdom is not a change of mind. It's a change of heart. Yeah. And truth and love. Truth and love. Love and truth. That's exactly right. Matter of fact, Ephesians 4 really is truthing in love. That's exactly right. That both of those things have to have to work together. So this this gospel grid, right, helps us to understand these issues and, yep. and to be crystal clear. And we're going to get into this uh, even more this Sunday uh, with Ephesians chapter 2. But the, the gospel grid of God created and it's good. Yep. Right? Sin broke everything. Yep. It devastated right? <laughs> us. It devastated the world. Yep. Uh, and so we live in a world that's profoundly broken. Yep. Uh, all the time when I read the news, I just think, post-Genesis 3 world, right. post-Genesis 3 world. Uh, and I think sometimes we, we again, want to kind of explain away uh, some of the mess of the world, but you have to go back to that reality. That's right. So the only thing that could rescue us from that, as you've pointed out, is God's grace. Right. Nothing we could earn, nothing right. we could deserve, nothing we could work towards uh, in and of ourselves. And so God stepped into history 
himself in the incarnation in the person of Jesus, uh, who paid the penalty for our sins, who was resurrected from the dead as God's amen, yep. uh, victory over sin and death, so yep. that every man, woman, boy, and girl who turns from themselves uh, to Jesus as Savior uh, will be reconciled to God forever. Amen. Right? Right. So, so th- mm-hmm. those pieces of the gospel, but we have to see these current issues yep. right through that lens. That's right. God created things in a certain way, but sin has distorted them. Right. And so because of that, that, right? Our hope is in Jesus. Right. And so it's only when our heart is made right to God That's can right. we then even be reconciled in ourselves. That's right. Find and discover our true identity and then be able to help others on that journey as well. That's right. Because that's another thing that the gospel does. It launches us back out into the world with the love of Christ. That's right. And so I think that's that grid that we have to learn to think in all of the time right. for ourselves versus, hey, here's this issue. Well, what does my social media feed right. have to say? Or what is this commentator I have to say? Or this blogger that I listen to, right? right? Um, they, they may have some informed opinions and they may be good. And that's, I like to gather as many informed opinions as as I can, but ultimately I want to go back to think to myself, okay, so when, when God created, right, what, right. what was the original intent here, right. what has been distorted or broken That's by the exactly fall, right. right? And how has Jesus come to heal and redeem, right? right? Seek and save that which was lost, right. which is the way it's put in Luke chapter 19. And that redemption is critical. Yeah. Right, that the Lord comes to redeem things. And and we often lose kind of what the purpose of that is, mm-hmm. right? We think we're trying to defeat something, and, and what the Lord's doing is redeeming things. Mm-hmm. Because there are ways, right, because you come from a hopeless situation. We all come from a hopeless situation, and the Lord redeems that. And, and often, like, we, w- w- the bad things that have happened to me and the things I did before I was a Christian become a story that I can use to help walk others to Jesus. Right, and that's fantastic that he can redeem even things, right, that weren't meant for good, right? He can make them, he can work them to his purposes, work them to his glory. Yeah, I like to say what the enemy intends to sabotage, right, God will superintend uh, for his purposes, and he'll use those as areas of of redemption in our heart and our life. Joseph, right? (laughs) Great example. Just just straight out, right? What you intended for evil, God intended for good. Yeah. And let me show you how he can redeem even even what people are trying to do to be destructive. Yeah. Right. To to build the kingdom and to show grace and to show hope. Yeah. That's yeah. so good. So we're off and running. Uh, the communications department has given us a wonderful list. I don't yeah. think we've answered hardly any of these questions because yeah. you and I just, this is what we do uh, when we're together. But I, I think this is an interesting question they posed kind of coming out of yesterday's sermon. How does the Holy Spirit prevent the church mm-hmm. from straying away from the fundamentals of the gospel? That's a fantastic question. That is a fantastic question. Um, yeah, the, the Holy Spirit, right, indwells us. Mm-hmm. And so we we believe in spirit-led order, yeah. right, so that the Holy Spirit leads us. And the Holy Spirit will compel you toward things, right, toward things of God. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of when we knew our boys were saved, was they, they were compelled to do things that teenage boys just didn't naturally do. And we knew that was the Holy Spirit compelling them toward those things. And yeah. so if, if we are humble and, and grateful, right, and, and, and submit our lives to, to the Word, and so we need to be in daily disciplines individually, right, reading Scripture, praying, repenting, you know, every day. And that helps us walk in obedience, but we also need community. Right. And one of the things you talked to you and I talked about when we started the, the pandemic was, you know, we're getting ready to find out is the church because the fabric of the church is who are you taking care of and who's taking care of you mm. within the church. Mm. Right. And that's the fabric and that interlaced fabric is what holds us together. Mm. And it's so beautiful. And that's what the Holy Spirit enables and engages yeah. is that community. And then from from there, it draws us back because we're drawn back, compelled back to the word, compelled back. That keeps us right on the correct path, on the path through God's words through holy things. Yeah, that's good. Let's continue to apply that to the church, right? You started with ourselves and how the yep. Holy Spirit right, compels us, and then how he compels us as a community as we care for one another. Yep. Uh, let's talk about this idea com- uh, related to power, right? And right. In Romans 1, we looked at yesterday, right? It is God's power. Uh, and so I, I think that one of the other dynamics that takes place is the Holy Spirit moves when God's people are obedient to his word. That's exactly right. So when you see the power of God yep. at work changing lives, 
overcoming strongholds, breaking addictions, bringing uh, people who are far from Christ to life in Christ, right? Then, then you know, right? The Holy Spirit is at work. Conversely, if we're not obedient to God's ways, if we've lost, if we've lost confidence in the gospel, if we're uh, subtly or unsubtly, right, pointing to other gospels or other ways, then I think there's a, a reduction of the Spirit's power uh, because this power is going to go where the gospel goes. Right. Well, in the power of God, right, God can do whatever God wants to do. Absolutely. Right? It, the question is, is in our faithfulness, will he do it in and through us? Yeah. Right, and will he? And that's part of the what transforms us right into the likeness of Christ. Yep. Is that power of the Holy Spirit acting through us? And we do that with the. I love that we do that with each other. Right, yep. it's so critical to do that as a, to gather together and do that in community. And and that's such a lost thing. So, so many people. One of the things social media does right is it isolates. Right. While it feels like you're connected, you're actually not. You're actually alone. Yeah. And that's one of the frightening things that social media draws is instead of actually building community, it tends to build it to build isolation. Yeah, it's why I think there's no there's nothing on earth like the Church of Jesus Christ, right? Because it brings people together. It's infused with the power of the Holy Spirit, right? It's powered by God's Word, right? Uh, and, and there's there's something unique and powerful to that. Well, and it brings people together. That w- right? when you look at our congregations on Sunday morning. There's no other reason they would be sitting in that room together. That's right. right. If you tried to get us together to like order a pizza, you right. couldn't do it, right? <laughs> right. You're going to want, exactly you know, right. extra cheese. I'm going to want, you know, some crazy <laughs> toppings. You're going to want a different kind of crust. But yet somehow <laughs> in all of our brokenness, right. uh, as the redeemed uh, of the Lord, right, we gather together to worship, to serve, to grow. It is a pretty remarkable thing when you stop to think about and it. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? There's no, nothing. And he always drives to unity. Yeah. Right. That's that's the thing is when you watch the Holy Spirit work, He will drive us to unity because He drives us into His Word. Right. And in His Word, we will find unity. Mm-hmm. Right. We will find that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Yep. Good. Let, let's uh, no. That's fantastic. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, let's continue this theme out of Romans one uh, okay. sixteen of I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah. As I mentioned on Sunday, the reason why Paul writes that is because he knows we're going to be tempted to be ashamed of the gospel. Right. And we live in an era, and I don't want to judge other churches, other pastors, their motives or those kind of things, but in which we see a lot of gimmicks or we see a lot of ways in which, again, maybe subtly, we're, we're shrinking back from just declaring the power of the gospel, trusting in other methods, trusting in other means, uh, those kind of things. Let's talk about that for a minute, you know, as far as being ashamed. What does it look like for the church to not be ashamed of the gospel? Yeah, I love the word you used, boldness, right? That we mm-hmm. should be bold with the gospel. But I, I think boldness to Christianity is very different than boldness to our culture, mm-hmm. right? Because boldness to our culture is often confrontational, mm-hmm. is often uh, you you deride somebody, you, you right? You're trying trying to win, and we're not trying to win, we're trying to show the glory of God, mm. right? And so when we're bold with the gospel, we live lives that authentically show we believe what Jesus said, mm. right? That's what boldly, that's what unashamedly living the gospel. We actually believe, right, that we can live peaceably with all men as much as it's up to us, mm. right? And that's what we should be known for. We should be a place where people can come and know they can be healed, whatever they're broken with. Right, mm-hmm. they should know we, we that they can be healed too. They can know that that this is the community they can they can come to. And so the mm-hmm. boldness is living out what Jesus actually taught us to do. Yeah. And that looks very very different. That is so distinct from the yeah. way our world functions. Yeah, it's so compassionate. It's so loving. Yeah, right. It, it 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 is so distinct. That is that will be bold just living that. Right. It's not. It goes back to the intellectual quips. Right. Or mm-hmm. the right the smart aleck ish answer tone sure. wise answers to things, right? That's not, that's not what bold for the gospel is. Gold, bold is bringing the love of Christ authentically in the way Jesus said to live. Yeah, I think a way to state that positively, right? If you're not ashamed, it means you are confident. That's exactly that's great. Gospel. That's a great word. And, and our confidence, again, is not merely in us and our ability to answer all the questions correctly, although we should, right? right. We should seek to understand Absolutely. Uh, those kind of things. But at the same time, there's a, there's a confidence that we have in Christ. Yep. That our job is to get people to the feet of Jesus. Yep. Kind of like the story of the the men, the friends of the paralytic, right? right. Tear through the roof, right. remove whatever bar- barriers there are. <laughs> That's right. In order to get our friends, our families, those who are lost and searching, to the feet of Jesus. Right. You know, and so I think there's a difference between uh, maybe a, an overconfidence in the flesh, right. And a humble confidence in Christ. That's right. Which means we we trust in the gospel and its work. That's right. You know, because a lot of times we plant gospel seeds, 
but it takes a while for them to grow. Right. Uh, a lot of times it takes a season, right, that we have to continually point back uh, to, to these truths over and over again. As I mentioned in the sermon, you know, Paul knew that. Right. Writing to the church at Corinth, right. you know, the, the, the church was overwhelmed by the decadence of Corinthian culture. Yes. Uh, you know, it was the Las Vegas of our time. What happens in Corinth stays Stay in, in Corinth, Corinth that's right? right? And so it's interesting to me that Paul says, yeah, I, I came in fear and trembling. Paul was not a guy who was easily intimidated. No. And yet before the Corinthian culture, he felt overwhelmed by that. But he said, I'll preach nothing less than Christ crucified, lest the gospel be emptied of its power. power. And he recognized, he said, the religious, the Jews, right, they're going to find this a stumbling block. Yep. Because the idea of a crucified Messiah was not anything that was in their worldview. Yep. And on the flip side, the Gentiles, right, the irreligious, they, they were going to find it foolishness. Right. Like, what, what do you mean this is the answer the world's been looking for, right? right? That a, that a crucified Jewish carpenter, right. right? That by believing and putting your trust and your faith in Him to rescue you from your sin, that that's that's the answer the world's looking for. Right. It seems foolishness to people, right. and yet we know that has that's how God has chosen to work. That's exactly right. That's why in Paul's introduction, right, he walks very quickly right through that that reality that Christ is the object of the gospel. Well, and that's what, you know, G.K. Chesterton says it's not too hard to find people to be a a uh, martyr for Christ, but it's very difficult to find people who be a fool. Mm. And I think maybe that's mm. part of the unashamedness, yeah. right? Being unashamed is that you may end up looking like a fool yeah. to the world. Yeah. And that's okay. Well, I think about some of the circles that you run in and some of our church members run in, right? Highly powerful, successful, I mean, your company, you consult with CEOs and you're in C-suites all of the time, you know, and, and yet, you know, what those people need and we believe the truth and love is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right. Well, and that's what I, that's what I try to bring, right? Because the Lord has put us where we're, right? We are to be a church on mission, which means each of us each day is representing Christ, just like a missionary, yep. wherever you are. And so that's what I look, I, I look, you know, a lot of companies, it's kind of weird. I've turned into a chaplain mm. for some of the companies where real people will come to me and I, I get to speak to people because I'm, I'm, I do data, right? And math. We they look to data and math for insights, and so I get to speak truth, and I can you know that can morph into gospel truth yeah. as the conversations kind of morph into things we talk about, and so it's wonderful to watch the Lord open up opportunities, mm-hmm. right, for the gospel if we're attentive to it. That's right, and that's part of what the Holy Spirit does. Back to back to the thing, right? Mm-hmm. Is, is it makes us attentive to the gospel opportunities before us, right? If you seek first the kingdom of God, because kind of what you seek is what you're going to see. Mm. Right, and if you seek first the kingdom of God, that's what you're going to see. Right, we've been doing the goodness of God right down at Station Hill. That goodness of God. If you seek the kingdom, you'll see the goodness of God. Right, and then you can just show other people. Look, look how good God is. Yeah, right? and, that, and that's what is we talk about equipping the church to have gospel conversations. That's right. A lot of it is praying that we will be spiritually attentive Amen. to the opportunities. And again, it doesn't matter if we're, we're communicating with CEOs or you know people on the street. Right. Um, the reality is, is God puts these opportunities in front of us to to show people both compassion. Yep. And conviction. That's right. As you were talking about earlier, right? Both truth, truth and, and love. love. To see them the way that Jesus sees them. That's awesome. Right. And to see the need that they have. So uh, we're kind of as we begin to kind of land the plane here. How do we as a church continue to align our vision with God's vision for reaching the world with the gospel? Because I think alignment, right? A lot of churches they they want to do a lot of good things, right? And and we're tempted sometimes. And the good can be the enemy of the great. It can. So how do we make sure that we stay in step? Uh, with the gospel-focused mission that Jesus has entrusted to us. One of the critical things is to listen to our calling Hmm. and help our members understand what they're called to do, right? Because God calls individuals. If you go look through Scripture time and time again, right, His call is to individuals to do things. Hmm. And I think we're a fabric of individuals. The church comes in where it's this fabric of individuals working toward gospel ends. Hmm. And so He will bring together these talents, right? We've seen it in our church, right, Hmm. The, the, the deaf congregation, right? What a miracle that is, right? We look at our Chinese congregation. We, we, we look at, at all the ways the Lord has called us to ministry because certain people answered their call, mm-hmm. right? We look at our deacon ministry and the magnificent things it does, right? Our, our, it, it's just awesome to see time and time again that people were called, our special needs now, right? Yeah. We, we see people called to, to do that and then watch the Lord work. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really, I think what we're going to need, what the church is going to need is, is identify those calls. And then what are we called to as a body? 
Yeah. Right. What are we called to as as a, as a, as an organ organism and organization? Right. And that that's really exciting to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you kind of see the gospel opportunities because and I know people are like, what you know, what's going to be like for my kids, my grandkids? All this. I think it's going to be you know Jesus is going to be there. Right. And so we don't have anything to fear. We've talked about fear, right, is, is ascribing power and authority to something. Mm-hmm. Right. And Great so definition. Isaiah 11 says, if you're if, you know, to fear the Lord, and Isaiah 12 says, don't be afraid. Yeah. And they don't contradict. It says, ascribe all power and authority to the Lord, and the world's got nothing. Mm-hmm. And we have to live lives understanding who has the power. Yeah, where the right? real authority is. That's exactly right. Yeah, and you know that authority and, and, again, that power enables us to move out into some of these hard, broken places yep. in the world. Again, special needs, foster and adoption oh, ministry, yes. food insecurity, yes. uh, you know, to really try to get upstream of where the real problem is. That's right. Uh, and as we go to those places and as we, we develop ministries using the, the fabric of our people who God has called to these things, yeah. again, the reason we tell people we're there is not to make much of us. Right. I think of the Sermon on the Mount where right. Jesus says, let them see your good deeds and give glory to our Father who's in heaven, right? Yep. And not not to men. And so we want to be careful that as we do these things, and this is where I think gospel-based ministry needs to live, it is both ministry and message. Yep. It's message and ministry. Yep. There are some places that are all about doing the ministry, and we get really focused on that, but we forget to tell them why we came. Right. Uh, we're here because Jesus saved us. Right. Uh, you know, and on the flip side, there are some churches that want to just pound the pulpit all the time with the message, but they don't lift a finger uh, to serve the needs in the community. Right. Instead, our confidence in the gospel comes in saying that as we, God moves us, the Spirit moves us into some of these hard places, that we have the answer that the world's looking for, and that's why we're there. Those things are intertwined. There's this false dichotomy, I think, sometimes in the church and in the Christian subculture uh, that says you can't do both of those things well, and I think the ministry of Jesus proves you can. Well, and often, right, the service leads to an authority. Yeah. Because they know you love them, they've watched you act in love toward them, then you get an authority to speak. Good. Right, and that's a beautiful thing, and I believe that's that's God God ordained. Yeah. That you know, as we serve people, they'll go, you know, you actually do love me, mm-hmm. right? Because love loves an action, right? We 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 love people in action, and that gives us that place, that time, and so when that gospel moment comes, mm-hmm. we're there, right? And they'll hear us. Yeah. How beautiful is that? Yeah. How beautiful is that? It is. Right? It is. Well, Brian, man, this has been a fun conversation. Uh, always. Uh, one of the things that's interesting yesterday, I just offhandedly <laughs> mentioned in the services, was, man, it's going to be fun to see what God does in the future. And several people responded to that yeah. um, because I think it is fun when we oh, get yeah. to know that we're giving our life uh, for a message that matters, for ministry that matters. Yep. Uh, and we want everybody to join us uh, in Amen. this mission. And so if you need to respond in any way, you, you know where to find us. <laughs> right. uh, just uh, go to BrentwoodBaptist.com uh, and uh, one of our team members would love to follow up with you. So, uh, so friends, that is it for today's episode. I'm grateful for Brian Ball being with us. We're going to have you back, Ryan, in the future. Uh, we hope this conversation was helpful for you as you apply this week's sermon to your whole life. Uh, if nothing else, thanks for listening in uh, as we chat. Um, if you did uh, find it helpful, please make sure to like this podcast, subscribe to our channel on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, your support helps us con- con- to, uh, to continue to bring you more engaging content uh, and inspiring content conversation. So uh, don't forget to hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. And next week, a little preview, our episode will feature our women's minister, Amy Jo Girardier. They have a big event this weekend and our preschool minister, Renee Blaine. Uh, They'll be sharing their wisdom and experiences in ministry as we continue to walk through the Disciples Making Disciples series. So thanks for listening and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.